our our final session for for the morning. Again, we uh, we have truly been blessed this morning. Amen. Brother Eric and Sister Delwana have have done a great job. I went back to get Sister Delwana, boy, and she was in the midst of it. I, I felt bad to stop her, but uh, time time says that we have to go ahead on. We're gonna uh, start, and Eric, you only have. And if, and if by chance you get through for that, that's all right. If you go a little longer, that's all right, too. Uh, and, and because as soon as Eric gets through, uh, we're going to give away just for a few minutes for any questions that, that anyone have. And so, Eric, I won't stand up anymore. So after you finish, uh, then you can just, just go right into the question uh, and comment session. All right. Last session of this day, developing relationships from generation to generation. Uh, certainly a very needed uh, lesson, and to end it all, wrap up what we've discussed so far. Uh, and, and I know you had a fact-filled seminar with tons of stuff thrown at you in a short amount of time, and all of it's like wet spaghetti, really. You just kind of throw it on the wall and hope something sticks. So, uh, But my prayer is that some of it will stick, and I, I'm not going to keep you long, but I want to thank you. Uh, you all in the leadership of this congregation and 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 um, and all of the the brethren and sister in here uh, for allowing me and my wife to facilitate this much needed seminar. And as we view this last lesson, this particular event, I wanna um, I was tasked with the, dis, the discussing the topic, um, developing relationships from generation to generation, and it, what a fitting topic this is to address um, this uh, to close out this overall theme of this seminar. And I wanna throw some figures at you that LifeWay Research in Nashville um, recently did. It shows that roughly 70% of young adults who indicated that they attended church regularly for at least one year in high school do in fact drop out of the church. The percentage of the dropout age range is this. Between 16 to 17, we have 10% dropout. From 17 to 18, we have 14% dropout. And in 18 through 19, we have 13% dropout. Now, these statistics are alarming, but they're not destructive because of those 70 percent, roughly 60 percent of the 70 actually return sometime later in life. But and this is not specific to just the Church of Christ. This is just Christianity overall. And it obviously it applies to us, too, because they 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 survey all what they would consider denominations. And the question is, how do we stop the bleeding when it comes to losing our youth? Well, this answer is a multifaceted one, and at the core of the solution uh, is the fact that we have to develop relationships from generation to generation. We've got to be able to bridge a gap. And so in order to achieve proper communication and a proper relationship, we've got to understand that some work has to be done. We know this is to be true in our relationship with God. In our relationship with our spouses, we got to it takes some work to keep it going. And in our relationship with our employees, even our relationship with our children, we've got to have an open door communication both ways. And we've got to bridge some gaps. Me and my wife didn't grow up alike. She grew up with two parents in a very stable household whose dad was a gospel preacher. I grew up crazy. So we had to bridge some gaps that we had between us once we got married, some ways of thinking, some ways that would give us a stable relationship. And the same thing applies to us and God. We were sinners. He's not. We got to bridge that relationship. It happens with our employers as, empl uh, uh, as employees. It happens between the church uh, and, and, and the congregation, but it also has to happen between the older and the younger. Just different mindsets. And so we got to bridge that gap. There are churches that implement uh, every emotionally charged gimmick they can to worship. And I've always said this, anytime you convert a person with a gimmick, it's going to take a gimmick to keep them. And so with all the hopes of reaching a youth, they apply these gimmicks and the youth still leave. They still leave. Why? Very simple relationship. Very simple is relationship. I want you to notice, number one, the perspective of the old. If you ask older Christians, why the youth leave the church? The common response is that the youth are too young to understand God. They, they, they want to be entertained in worship. 
they're worldly. They want to be, they want to be entertained rather than taught. They, they're, they're role models. You know, they look at role models, uh, Drake and Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj. That's their role models. Uh, their role models are uh, just evil people, debaucherous, and, and they still an IU from us. Honestly, I can't disagree with this. There is some truth in that. But I do disagree that doing the same thing we've always continued to do is going to work. I disagree with that. I agree that they have some outside influences that are not that are not proper for their spiritual growth. I understand that. But I disagree that keep on doing the same thing we're doing is going to work. That's going to save our youth somehow. It ain't been saving them. 70% of them leaving. So something has to change. Now again, as I stated before, um, so say I now again, I'm one of the most doctrinally sound and conservative preachers I know. So when I advocate change, I am never speaking about the doctrine of Christ or worship of the church. I need that to be absolutely clear. I'm talking about engaging our youth in such a way that multiple people have their hands on them within the congregation that will allow them to shape and mold some relationships within the church. There was some stuff I wanted to talk about or that will lead me from the first joint lesson to now that I'm going to talk about. The youth don't need more sermons about fleeing youthful lust. They don't need any more of those. I mean, those are good. We can continue to preach them because they're still true. They're as true now as they were when Paul wrote it. So it's still relevant. It's still true. So we don't stop preaching it, but that ain't, that ain't going to get it. We got to go above and beyond that. While this is good intentions... It's like giving somebody castor oil to cure sermon. I mean, cure cancer. Look at Jude 23, 22 and 23. Jude 22 and 23. Jude says, and on some have compassion, making a difference. He said, but on others, you pull them out. You snatch them out of the fire and hate even the garments that are spotted by the flesh. Church, while we will certainly use the unadulterated gospel. There is no universal one-size-fits-all teaching plan. There's no one-size-fits-all. Jews said on some, have compassion. See, some folk are going to respond to the goodness, the grace, and the mercy, the sacrifice of God. Some folk going to respond to that. Some folk just need to hear, get it right or you're going to hell. No, some folks just need to hear that. And that did all the world for them. They were like, man, I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to live right. That might be what they need. But guess what we can't do? We can't be hell, 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 hell all the time. Or grace, 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 grace all the time. Some folks we got to say with compassion. Some folks we got to say with fear. Paul said, with the fear of the Lord, I persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5.11. With the fear of the Lord, I persuade men. Sometimes it takes fear. Sometimes it takes compassion. And so we got to understand that one side don't fit all, all the time. Hebrews 5, 13 through 14. Turn over there with me real quick. He says, for everyone that is unskillful, for everyone that is unskilled in the word of righteousness, he is a baby. But strong meat, hey man, is that in the book? Strong meat belongs to who? Them who are what? Amen. Tell me what to say. Them, them who are full of age, who can do what? Yeah, they can digest it, but when they digest it, what happens? They have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. So we got to understand that one size don't fit all. Everybody's not at the same place at the same time. Some folk are still babes and some folk are grown. And if we're always teaching to those who are grown, we are going to leave the babes as babes. If we're always catering things to those that are grown, then we're going to leave the babes as babes. Not everyone develops at the same rate. And we must discern when dealing with the youth. Church, we've got to address the needs of all in the congregation, not just the adults. 
And I'm still talking about relationships, so just stick with me. Christians who've been in the church several years, that's what I'm talking about. The leadership is that has to have a balanced approach in making sure our youth feel just as vested in the congregation as we do. They got to feel like they have a purpose here. They got to feel like that if they're not here, somebody notices. They got to feel like they have a responsibility here. They have to feel like they're not going to church, but that they are the church. And the only way we're going to do that is by establishing relationships. Now, that can be hard because we're in two different generations. We're decades apart. So how do we bridge that gap? We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but right now I'm telling you a perspective that older people have. When you, when I talk to older people and I deal with older people, and it's like so stuck in their ways, and just, and just, 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 boy, pull your pants up, <laughs> or boy this, or girl that, or girl, you know that's too short. Well, okay, okay, granted, he needs to pull his pants up. Granted, that is too short for him. But church, who have you ever seen change based on you? knocking them over the head with something. When you change the mind of a person, you change the inside. The outside will automatically change. So what we need to do is we need to target this. And not always this. Now, yeah, we can be this and we can talk to them in a tone that says, hey, listen, I understand that's the style and everything, but let me, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Come sit down and talk with me. But pull your pants up. Let me tell you what, they're going to go down lower. I'm telling you, it's the postmodern generation. They question everything. They question authority. They question doctrine because they have information. The world is this big now. It used to be huge. But now it's this big. You get, I'm telling you, if we drop a bomb, there's an article about it before the bomb hits the ground. <laughs> there's an article already written. America drops bombs. And you're like, wait a minute hit the ground yet information is instant and knowledge is instant and so they've got things shaping their mind that's causing them to question yo you know yo always the way you always done things not everybody in the world does things the way you do them and very often they're just traditions it's the way we grew up the way we learn things and so we, they have to feel vested in the congregation. Paul told the elders at the church at Ephesus, he gave them the whole counsel of God. This conveys the idea that Paul was balanced in his preaching and his teaching, and so should we. We can't value the opinions and ideas of older Christians without consulting our youth about their needs and their desires. So we always go into older folk, hey, what is this? What do y'all think? What do y'all believe? What do y'all feel? When we should be doing that very same thing to the youth, hey, what do y'all think? What do y'all feel? What do y'all believe? What would y'all like to see? What would you like to see happen here at church? What would you, what would you like to do? What ministries would you like to see? What works would you like to see? How would you like the sermons to be preached? Why are we not asking them these things? Why are we not simply asking them? We walk by them like they don't even exist. We walk by them. They're just here. They come with mom and daddy, and we talk to mom and daddy, and we ask them, hey, how you doing? All right. Good to see you. Look pretty thing. And then we just go on, and we never ask them, hey, what would you like to see in Bible class? What would, you, what would you like to participate in? What kind of fun things do you think the church could do to help grow? Why are we not asking? They're not going to receive. I understand this. Even though we go to them, they got to understand that everything going to be a yes. Okay? They're not going to get a yes to everything. Just because you ask them, don't mean it's going to be a yes. But they'll at least feel like their opinion matters. They'll at least feel like that what they think matters at the congregation where they are coming every week. They're here every week and they want to feel like they matter. And so that's what older folk think. That's the perspective of the older folk. Oh, the reason they ain't growing is because it's their fault. It's their fault. They need to pull themselves up by their bootstrap and get, get in that book. Well, I'm going to tell you what, we might as well get ready to stay without you. If that's the thinking that we're going to have, we just might as well get ready to have a bunch of old folk in the congregation and then have another meeting about how can we grow to you. <laughs> Amen. We're going to meet about it. Amen. <laughs> we're going to meet about it. How can we grow our youth? And then we walk right past them and don't ask them. Number two, what about the perspective of the young? 
So we've talked about the perspective of the old. What about the perspective of the young? Young people that they, they feel that, again, they are invisible to the congregation. You talk to them. I talk to them. I ask them. They feel like they're, they're invisible to the congregation. They feel that the only time they get attention is when they've done something wrong. Right. Young people feel that the church is very hypocritical in its actions. Amen. People are always barking at the youth. Amen. Who your parents up? Who you, you, you? But then the older sister walk in with the same thing. Nobody said nothing right. to her. Nobody said nothing to her. She's showing all her Cleveland, Ohio. Nobody said nothing to her because she's older. She's an adult. But we'll get on young folk. And so they see that very hypocritical. They think the church is hypocritical. It's very hypocritical. You, you mean to tell me, you know, you want to talk to me about having a relationship and you want to talk to me about my boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, trying to date in the church. And then I got folk married that, and then folk here, amen, folk, live folk here married and, and they ain't, she ain't, he ain't a member of the church. Is she married to him? Y'all don't say nothing to them. Or, or is a brother and sister, they live together, they ain't married and you ain't saying nothing to them. Amen. Amen. The you, this is what you hear from them. They believe, they they see the church very hypocritical. Hypocritical. We get on them about stuff, but we don't, we don't get on other people about stuff. So, so the youth also feel that tradition has replaced doctrine in many areas. They see Christians bickering, fussing, and fighting over traditional things. When they see the church arguing over the color of the carpet, they're like, I don't want to be no part of this. And doctrine, and then doctrine about the color of the carpet. Who said we got to have carpet anyway? Not as of opinion, but yet it will split churches. And the youth see this. Like they see this. They're not stupid. I'm telling you, they're not stupid. They can see through the facade. They can see through the, the this this whole uh, image we got put up of righteousness and piety. They see straight through it. Amen. They see straight through it. And, it's, and parents, we have a we have a we have a role in this too. And we're gonna tell our kids not to lie, but then when the bill collector calls, tell them ain't here. That's very hypocritical. That's very hypocritical. What color is the carpet going to be? They see us meeting over this kind of stuff. And having knocked down, drag out fights. What co Why did we change worship time? It's the Lord's day all day, ain't it? Amen. Who cares? Why we start taking communion before the sermon, when for years we've taken it after the sermon. Why, why we have to wear this kind of color for our ladies' day? Amen. <laughs> Maybe that's just Avondale. Sir, so they're not stupid. They're not stupid. Um, the young people also feel that older Christians only care about outward appearances and not their inward struggles. They think all you care about is the way they look or how they're wearing their clothes or how they're wearing their hair. They think that's all you care about. You don't care about what they're actually having to deal with. Look at John chapter 7. Um, 24. Look at John 7, 24. Here, Jesus says, uh, uh, judge, judge not outward appearances, but judge a righteous judgment. Now, I know in Matthew chapter 7, people say, you know, they want to quote real quick, judge not lest you be judged. Because yeah. whatever judgment you judge, that's a good that's a judgment. You're going to be judged. Well, let me tell you what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7. He's talking about a hypocritical judge. Right. They're like saying, don't you smoke. And then you smoke. That's, that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. Because we are to judge. We're commanded to judge. Right. However, chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 1. Yeah. Unless that ain't in your book. Is that in your book? Yeah. Judge yeah. not based on our appearance, but judge a yeah. righteous judgment. Yeah. So we can judge. How in the world can I admonish my brother when he lives in error if I don't judge? Amen. And so what the youth see is they see a hypocritical judgment. They see the Matthew 7 judgment when what we should be giving them is a John 7 judgment. Not the Matthew 7, but the John 7. We are the judge, church. When the archangel Michael, when he contended with Satan, he didn't even judge Satan. Do you know that? In the book of Jude, verse 9, uh, let's, let's go over there. I want to show you something. Even now, 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 remember when, 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 the, uh, when, when the devil and and and, uh, and the archangel Michael when they had their fight. You'll remember here in June, 
Jude talks about talks about faith six there because he mentioned every hand. They made Paul Satan and, 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 and Michael Paul. And look at what Jude said about it. Jude said, yet yeah, Michael, the archangel, was contending with the devil. He disputed about the body of Moses, but he did not bring against him a real accusation. What are you saying, Jude? Even when Michael fought Satan, he didn't judge Satan. The father lies. Michael didn't hit him with a bunch of, oh, you devil, you bad person, you evil man, you. Yeah, we're going to fight over Moses, and that's going to be the end of it. But not even, not even the archangel gave railing accusation, accusation against the devil. But look at verse 9. But all he said to him, what, what, he didn't say nothing to Satan. He didn't bring against Satan any railing accusation. But what was the one thing he said to him? The Lord will hit you. He didn't say, uh, you a devil, you a liar. Boy, you pull them pants up. Your hair, look at your hair. Look at what you're listening to. Not even the archangel did that to Satan. Yeah, we do it to our youth all the time. And that's what they see. That's what they feel. Even if it's not quite coming off that way, perception is reality. What they feel like they see and what they feel like they're experiencing, that's their reality. Yeah. You know, I used to manage banks for many years. Actually, I managed the bank where that, 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 you know, Ralph has been famous for. <laughs> it's a manager branch at First Tennessee. I'm walking, so, I, so I'm going to one of our sister banks in Chattanooga. I had to go down there for something. I had to, I was, we were having a meeting there or something. Y'all, I walked into the, I didn't know Ralph was on no commercials. I walked in the bank to hear the life, life, life size cut out of Ralph. <laughs> it, it was the craziest thing. I'm walking, I'm just walking in, you know, ready for my meeting here hearing Ralph looking at me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it about knocked me down, y'all. I ain't know nothing about this whole First Tennessee thing. And, uh, but, as, as, but I used to manage, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, but, but I forgot where I was going with that. Thought. <laughs> Ralph done got me all torn up. But again, while I do what now? Yeah. Yeah. And so again, while I agree, um, with the young people's assessment, I know I was going with that. Their perspective is reality. When you, you do bank research and, and you get these uh, about customer service. And, you know, somebody who somebody who waits in a line for five minutes, if they wait in the line for five minutes and they have a bad experience once they get to the, the customer service rep, they will say they waited for 10 or more minutes. When they only really waited for five, if they get up there and have a great experience, they'll say, I, I only waited for like two minutes. Perception is reality. And with, and with our youth, very often their perception it are these things. And even though it might not quite happen that way, it is their reality. It is their reality. And we have to remember that. And so I agree with their assessment. I agree with a lot of the stuff that the youth believe. And I, and I, but I can't agree. So as I agree with some of the stuff the older people are saying, I disagree with some things. And with the youth, I agree with a lot of great things. But then I disagree with the youth here. I disagree that that older Christians are past their time. I, I disagree with that. Young people, just like you are a prisoner of your decade, older Christians went through the exact same thing just in a different decade. Solomon said that there is absolutely nothing new under the sun, and don't be so naive to think that older Christians are so out of touch that they can't tell you something. I know your swag is on fleek, Older folk, if you don't know what that means, talk to a younger person. You need to understand what that means. Their swag is on fleek. But you got to understand that fads and fashion, they change faster than the weather. They change faster than the weather, younger folk. You got to understand that. Your fads and your fashions and your, and, and, and your swag and your fleek is going to be another word tomorrow. It was, another, it was a word back in the 60s that they used for the, to describe the same thing. You talking about your swag being on fleek. They said the same thing, just different words, different decade. Turn with me, Ecclesiastes 1, 4 through 11. And I'm going to get you there real quick. Mike, read that for us, brother. Ecclesiastes 1, 4 through 11. I'm going to put you to work, brother. And then we're going to close up the lesson. With one more, with one more thought, and then we're going to close up the lesson. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to bring it all together. 
Ecclesiastes. Like you're a New Testament. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 1 through 11. Like I only had forty, I only had forty-two minutes, brother. Man. Let's go. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses one through eleven. One through eleven. Yeah. So I, so I returned and considered all the oppressive that I've done under the sun. Excuse me, excuse me. Ecclesiastes one four through eleven. I'm sorry. Ecclesiastes one four through eleven. Okay. Sorry about that. Ecclesiastes one. Yeah. Four through 11. Yeah. Yeah. The words of the preacher. One Verse four. Mm-hmm. One generation passed away and another generation coming, but the earth abides forever. So things pass away and come. They come and go, they come and go. But the earth abides forever. Read. The sun also arises and the sun goes down mm -hmm. and hastens to his place where he rose. Mm -hmm. The wind goes toward the south and turneth unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returns again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, till they return again. All things are full of labor. Mm -hmm. Man cannot utter it. The eyes not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Mm -hmm. The thing that had been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. Mm -hmm. And there is no new thing under the sun. Right. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It had been already of old time, mm -hmm. which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are come with those that shall come out. I said all that, or Mike read all that to say this, young people. It, it, things come and go. Things come and go. But yet they're the same things. One generation comes, another one goes. The wind goes north and south. It's still the wind. It's, it's the same stuff, it's just in a different time, a different decade. So don't ever be so naive to think that older people can't understand you. But you just got to be able to trust them. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But in 1 Kings chapter 12, and you don't have to turn there, I remember when Rehoboam took over the kingdom after his father Solomon died. And the people called Rehoboam to a meeting. They said, hey, they said, lighten the burden that your daddy put on Solomon. He was, he was heavy on us, and he had a heavy hand on us. And if you lighten your burden, we'll follow you even better than we followed your dad. So Solomon said, uh, Rehoboam said, well, let me think on these things. He sought two types of counsel, of advice. He went to the older, wiser people of Israel. He said, hey, this is what the people want me to do. What do you think? They said, hey, listen, hearken to them. Your dad was a tough man. He put some heavy burdens on us, taxed us, you know, took our money. You know, he was a good, you know, he's a good guy. We followed him. We loved him. But if you lighten our burden, they will follow you. Those people will follow you and love you more than they loved your father. He said, I'm going to think on that. He called his friends, the guys he grew up with, those the same age. And he said, the people want me to do this. What y'all think? They said, man, if we were you, we'd make it even harder than their daddy. They wouldn't know who your daddy was when I finished with it. If I was you, I would make it even more. He listened to his friends, and he split the kingdom of God into two kingdoms. With the ten tribes going, or well, really nine and a half tribes going north and being then keeping the name Israel, and then two and a half tribes staying south and being called by the name of Judah. Now I believe if Rehoboam had to listen to the older, wiser folk, he could have kept God's uh, kingdom or united at least for a period. Now, we don't know who else would have came along and split it, but at least it wouldn't have happened under him. So finally, we get the perspective of the old and we get the perspective of the young. But finally, what is the what is the perspective that's proper? So we got the perspective of the old. We got the perspective of the young. But what's the perspective that's proper? What's the proper perspective? Who's right in all of this, the old or the young? Well, obviously, the old and the young both have valid frustrations with each other. So with that being said and that being the case, how do we bridge this gap? and develop relationships between the generations. I want to mention just four actions research has proven strengthens intergenerational relationships. Just four, and there's many, and then I will be done by 10 minutes till. Well, never mind, I get all the way to 12, don't I? Oh, well then never mind. They say right here, 12 to 1215 question and answer. All right. Um, I, want to, I want to mention just four actions research has proven 
uh, for intergenerational relationships. Number one, got to have the spirit of Christ. Both young and old attempt to see through each other's eyes. You gotta understand, attempt, put in work to actually foster relationships where y'all can see each other's reasoning. Like I said, God said, come now, let us reason together. Whether we're old or young, our perspective differs based on experience and life settings. You gotta respect what each other can bring to the table. All right, you gotta respect it. For the young, for the youth, the older Christian can help you gain wisdom. For the older Christian, the youth can help you stay young and help you understand what's relevant in order to reach them. So everybody brings something to the table. Number two, don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Amen. Older people, don't think that ne older necessarily means wiser. Job chapter 32, verses 1 through 12, because it doesn't. Just because you older don't mean you wiser. There's folks been in their church 35 years and still can't quote the plan of salvation. Amen. Young people realize that older Christians are... Uh, as out of touch as they may seem, they have experiences that you just don't have. I don't care how many schools you go to. Books do not replace real life experience. Amen. Be able to admit, both sides need to be able to admit when they're wrong about something and be willing to apologize. When a young person can see an older person apologize and admit that they're wrong, that does tremendous help toward them building a relationship with you number three be genuinely interested church do you know when we're being fake or when we're being real get to know our youth learn their likes their dislikes their goals their aspirations their dreams their ideals about life learn listen to them be genuinely interested don't be fake interested like genuinely sit down and talk with them just listen what advice or help can you give them toward that end? Helping them fulfill their goals, their dreams, their aspirations. How can you help them? And finally, and this is just four, and there are several others, but, but these four are proven by research. Trust each other. Old people have a problem trusting youth and vice versa. Got a problem trusting each other. Leadership. You got to entrust some of the jobs and the services in the church to the young people. Give them a role. Give them a job. Give them a responsibility that makes them feel vested and needed here. Make them feel like they are a part of this congregation. Make them feel like that if they're not here, there is a job that's not being done. They have to feel like, again, I'm not talking about working, doing worship, or preparing the Lord's Supper. These things are important. These are great things, but I'm talking about the Monday through Saturday stuff. Like, let them clean the van. Give them a responsibility of cleaning the van. Let them run the studio. Let them design and maintain a website for you, because they can. Amen. <laughs> Let them come up with activities for the youth. Let them mail out tracks. It's their job to mail out tracks. Give them a mail and listen. Tell them you got to put them in envelopes. Mail them. Give them a job. But just I'm just things I just just brainstorm. Give them a job to where they feel responsible. This way they don't feel like again they're going to church, but they feel like they are the church. Young people. Trust older people. Trust that older people can get in line with you and understand where you're coming from. They can, but you got to trust them. You got to open up to them and you got to let older people in. You know, you can't have this wall of this up this wall that everything is great in my life and I don't deal with nothing and everything's fine and perfect. They, if they are showing a genuine interest, you got to open up and you got to open up and let them in. And I know that's tough, but God put them in your life for a reason. I put them in your life for a reason. In conclusion, again, thank you for allowing me and my wife the opportunity to facilitate this, this magnificent seminar. And I pray that through it all, Christ has been magnified, that you have been edified, and that the devil has been terrified. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this day that you bless us with, allowing us to come together and share ideas and lessons and fellowship one with another regarding our youth and how do we place things in developing them and give them a firm foundation and help uh, foster relationships between us. Father, we pray that all things have been done well, pleasing and acceptable in your sight and that everything that has been has been suggested has has had scriptural foundation and that we all have been better for it. Father, we pray that as we go forward and trying to reach our youth that we'll be diligent and 
and reaching them doing things according to the holy and divine will that will edify the church and not and not draw it away from what the truth of the gospel is father we pray for our youth and the things that they're going through in this world things that even though we understand there's nothing new under the sun uh, things that they have uh, experiences to a lot earlier than than we were able to experience so father we pray for them that we can be in their lives and set proper examples that they can have something to and someone to look to when they need to to see you or when they can't see you because uh, because they don't have experiences that have uh, completely drawn them to you that we can be that example that they need to see Father God, we just pray for this wonderful congregation here at Green Meadow and all the congregations that are, are represented and present. We pray that you'll bless us all, Father God, as we try our very best to, to, to make you relevant to our youth, but again, according to truth. Father, we thank you, we love you, and it's by the authority of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I guess at this time we have a question and answer session. Any questions that I can answer? Yeah, I was thinking uh, how important it is to uh, uh, have new convert classes, mm -hmm. and then but before we get to the new convert, how important it is to uh, begin teaching young people how that there is no one, mm -hmm. and because we know what's going on in our society today, as we talked earlier about Christian, mm -hmm. uh, to me that is one of the and and that that would be a um you know i to me that is not even as challenging as it is to get some adults to see that there's only one i i have just as much trouble with bible studies and helping even adults see that there is only one there is a survey that we gave out at avondale just to see it was an anonymous survey just to see where the congregation stood and anytime you anytime somebody ain't got to put their name on it they'll talk all day you know, when, when they got to put their name on something so we gave an anonymous survey and it had all these doctrinal questions on it you know it's probably about three page survey just spill it out real quick turn it in no name and we put it together me and the elders we put it together and we lumped them all by answer you know what people believe we asked a question on one of those surveys um uh does the Lord only have one church was one of the questions. And another one of the questions was, can you be saved outside of the Lord's church? Folk at Avondale, and we still don't know who they are because it was anonymous. Folk at Avondale still believe that the Lord they will approve more than one church and that you don't have to be in church to be saved. So that's not something that's just specific to, to the youth. That's just a teaching that you even owe the folk still, you know, they, they, they show up on Sundays, they sit in our pews, they listen to our sermons, they come on Wednesday, they don't kick up a fuss, they don't make waves, and in their mind, they believe that, oh uh, yeah, my brother's going to be saved because he's a deacon over there at the back church. So that, well, if we can figure that out, uh, you know, if you, if you find out a way to do that, let me know. And I will, I will be more than happy. But it's, it's not just the youth. And I believe there are things that, that, that will happen in our youth classes and when we're educating them like i said in the first lesson when we're educating them then obviously that's where the, the idea that that the oneness and doctrinal um ends up. like for instance i know at avondale um we give out a a book you know uh, when when somebody's new convert and it's titled why i'm a member of the church of christ and so um, it's because we feel like that's a really very easy read and it's not it's not it's not written to i mean it's broken down in chunks and people can see scripture real quick and real easy so and things like that. But Ralph. The foundation, yeah. when they get older, or when they get older, they Well, you have to remember that God established three divine institutions. And he established them in this order. He established the family, the government, then the church. Three divine institutions that God created and stamped with his approval outside of the 18th time. He created a home first. Why? The home has a huge responsibility in this whole idea about our kids truly, um, truly. Because see, what has happened is the church has, has begun to take the place of the home. And so now parents want the church to entertain their children. And that's really your job. Right? It's, not, it's really not the church's job to be moving night and skating. 
but if, if the home ain't gonna do it, somebody gotta do it. This is like public schools. It's like public schools. Public schools have had to become the home for a lot of kids. They're not getting fed at home. They're not got getting clothed at home. They don't got in the, you know their parents have crazy, so they gotta get counseling at school. They getting free lunch at school. They they got clothing closets at school because the school gotta become the home. And say so they home ain't doing it. Somebody gotta do it. So that's why that's how a lot of this responsibility has fallen on the church. Because homes are not doing what we're supposed to do as parents and as as husbands and wives teaching our children. Because if you look, if you look in the Bible, especially during the patriarchal age and even the Mosaic age, the heads of and not even that, even in the Christian dispensation in, in Ephesians chapter six, uh, Paul says, "Ye fathers, provoke not the children around, right, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord." So we have a responsibility, but we want the elders or the preacher or the Bible class teacher to do it, or even a youth minister. You know, that, that's your job. It's not my job to teach my child about God or about the doctrine or about scripture. It is our job. And so if it's if they only think about this, if they only are learning about the church on in a 45 minute Bible class on Sunday, because in the sermon they, they're checked out. They're checked out during the sermon. I'm telling you, they're checked out during the sermon. So a 45 minute Bible class and maybe if they show up on Wednesday night that's hit or miss right there hit or miss showing up on Wednesday night so you mean to tell me the only time they hear anything about God is 45 minutes on a Sunday now, there's only 52 Sundays in a year y'all <laughs> only 52 Sundays in a year so you're doing less than 45 less than an hour and most of the time, it's not doctrinal. It's not on things that they need. we need to build foundation. So 45 minutes times 52, let's just say it was an hour. That's 52 hours. 52 hours in a whole year that they experience God. So that's going to fall on the home. That is going to fall on the home. Never throughout God's word do we see God take away the role of the home. It was the first divine institution he created, Genesis 2.24. The home. And he, and that's why he compares the church to the home. That's why he calls it the house of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. That's why he says, husbands, love your wives of Christ, love the church, 5.25 Ephesians. And so that's that's why. You know, um, but we need more Joshua's. 24.15, I don't know what y'all going to do. But you need to choose this day who you going to serve. Whether the God that your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods in whose country you now are in. That's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. And so we don't have enough Joshua's. Not enough Joshua's in our homes. And so there's only so much the church can do you know, without parental involvement, which is such a struggle. It's a struggle in the church. It's a struggle in the schools. It's a struggle in a community. It's a struggle. But Jared, how do you well, you know, it, it, it's it's a it's a mindset that Paul, um, it's the mindset, and, it, and Paul, he had to deal with this. Um, he had to deal with this with 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 the Jews, and it's actually the the entire book of Hebrews is about that whole that whole the the the, the idea of Hebrews is is. Their religion was 1,500 years. Not only was it their religion, it was their history. So it's a little bit different than we. Than, than our religion is not our history. Their religion also was their history. It was the same thing. You know, Moses was not only their spiritual leader, but he was, they were, a lot of them came from out of, they were the blood. You know, that was their blood. And so the whole book of Hebrews is about Jesus being better than a dead religion. So what the Hebrews writer has to do throughout the book of Hebrews, and I'm actually teaching a sermon series on that in our evening service, I'm walking through the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, the writer is saying, until you let go of, of this dead letter, you cannot go forward in Christ. That's why he says in Hebrews chapter 6, starting verse 1, he said, let us not lay again the foundation. Let us not first principles of the oracles of God. We, we shouldn't be having to do this. But they were so bent on staying the same, they were afraid of change because with, actually with that change came some persecution. You know, when they were just Worshiping under Judaism, everything fine. Nobody's bothered them. Now they became Christians, man. They enemies of the state now, and and everybody trying to get them. So they wanted to run back. But it's this whole idea that we control the church. 
So while we can't control cars coming, you know, we can't control airplanes. We can't control, but we can control the church. We can control what goes on here and what we say is going to go. And that's that's what we've always done. And so that's all, what we're always going to do. And that's going to be a attitude that is going to keep us from growing and keep and, and continue to help us um, lose our youth at alarming rates that we are. You know, with the technology, like you said, you know, I mean, can you imagine, like, what somebody would have said 20 years ago, 30 years ago about putting a microphone in the building? You know what I'm saying? Or putting, you know, having a studio back there? I mean, so we, we can understand those little bitty things like that, but when we're talking about the youth, it scares us to death. We're just terrified. You know, we're just terrified. Like, little stuff like that, we understand it because it's us, and we've accepted it. And we're trying to help the youth bridge uh, or build a relationship with God. And, and, and again, you just got to understand them and where they live. This is terrifying. You know, and, and Chloe is on the same page. I mentioned something to you earlier about that. As we talk about this change in the generation, uh, we talk about the allowances that we have to make to youth and things that we need to do to target our youth to get them in, into service. Mm -hmm. What is the buffer that you use in terms of the things that we got to do for those people that are set in that way? Because the resistance is going to come and we don't want to turn it into a them against us. Yeah. Uh, we want this to be a family. Yeah. So I'm saying we, we're going to have to address some things with the older generation just like we do with the, with the young generation mm -hmm. so I, well, let's put this up and let's do some things because this is where they at because they are where they at mm -hmm. what can we do to to make sure that they're when i say the seven well, i know they may not be told this other book yeah. have you put anything in place to, to deal with that yeah good, good question um so what we're doing at avondale is first of all you know leadership you know there um we I mean, we have meetings, you know, uh, myself, the elders and deacons, and we have meetings. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. It even took, it even took my, it took my elders a, a little bit. You know, some of the stuff I was proposing early on, they were like, I mean, they were a little, you know, they were like, mm -hmm. but as you can see, nothing has changed doctrinally. No, I mean, again, you know, Avondale is considered the conservative church, you know, and we, we're considered a conservative church. If that's a moniker that we want to use, I I just see us as a, simply trying to do what the book says. Other people see us as conservative. Well, um, when when I got to Evandale, we didn't have a website, right? And I was just blown away by this. I don't have a website, and so I said, we, we need a website. Well, you know, they was like, well, well, get some things to us, pose it, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So, all right, whatever. So. So I got stuff together. I proposed. I took it to him, and I didn't hear nothing back from him, you know, for a minute. I kept on, hey, 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 you know what I'm saying? So we finally get a website. Oh man, it's it's, it's great. Actually, it's, it's being it's under construction right now because it's being re but so it's we're actually updating it. It's about to pop even better and be a little bit be be better. Well, we get a website, right? We get a website. So we we we, we take it to the congregation. Let them know they approve it. I was like, okay, let's do it. So, because I had to show them, look, this is where the world is. <laughs> this is where the world is, and we go, and we stuck. Do you you know where Avondale is located? If y'all don't know where we're located, we are not the easiest place to find. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like we stuck in the middle of the middle of the middle. <laughs> like you gotta take turns and stuff to get, and it's it's and, and that's great. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, we ain't off a highway. You ain't gonna see us right at all, you know, and just pull over. You gonna, you gotta be looking for us. If you gonna come there, you gotta be looking for us. And so, and so, we we get a website. We start incur and we we sold it to the you know, I, I sold it to them. They finally got them board. Sold it to the congregation. They were like, okay, okay. So we got a website put together. Start encouraging the congregation. Go to the website. Go to it. Go to it. Go to it. Put, I start putting scriptures on there. I put the scripture on there, and y'all can still go AdventCSC.org. Um, if you look at our scripture page, every year I put up monthly scriptures that can help you read the Bible in a year. And so we do that every year. It's a scripture challenge. So uh, people go there for that. We have people can make comments. They can ask us questions. Um, they can they can get a Bible correspondence course. So we, we've had correspondence courses with people outside the church that want to know more about the Bible and become Christians. Um, we've had it increased our traffic. So when people are visiting Chattanooga and they're looking for a church, they, they, people go to Google. 
People ain't looking at phone books no more. They going to Google Churches of Christ in Chattanooga. And in our and if you hit if you if you Google right now, Churches of Christ in Chattanooga, the first website that's gonna pop up is AvondaleCoc.org. Because what we did, we encouraged our older members, look, get on a computer somewhere, visit it daily, get our hits up. Because when our hits got up, then search engines started to recognize people are hitting our site. So now we're getting visitors from places. Because on there, I, I wrote the page. I wrote the whole website, all the content. But I, we had to hire somebody to do it. But I wrote all the content so people know what we believe, how we worship, when our worship times are, how to get to us. And so people are showing up. Oh, we found you on the website. White people. Come to Avondale. Because they saw us on the website. And they saw what we believe. And they were like, hey, this is as good as any. And so so that's, that's, that's one thing. Hold, hold on real quick. And then so we did it, and then we didn't have a website. So we didn't have, you know, we didn't have uh, uh, just simple things. Facebook page, right? Got us a Facebook page. Now it's like people visiting our Facebook page, liking our page, asking us questions. I'm having, I had a Bible study, met up with a guy, met up with a guy. He hit our page and was like, look, I, I see y'all website. I like what y'all talking about. You know, I'm looking for a church. He was not a member of the church, but I'm looking for a church. I'm tired of these churches doing everything I can't see in the Bible, and y'all look right. I want to know more. Man, so I'm studying with this guy over Facebook, studying with him. And so we finally meet up, me and me and one of my deacons. We meet up, we study with him. He likes what he's hearing, but he, had, he didn't obey, but that opened the door for us to meet. So, so we got a website, we got a Facebook page, now we got... You know, now we got screens up. We got, I mean, you know, we're, we're heading in that direction. We're looking at a youth minister. So minds don't change overnight. They don't change overnight. And it takes them to see the end result. You have to deliver the end result. This is the end result, and it's not going to compromise doctrine. This is the end result. It's not going to compromise doctrine. All right, next one. You, you just asked what I was going to say uh, when, when you said about seeing the progress. When I was talking about the preparing or having that bubble between the old and young, mm -hmm. they'll see the difference. Like when you explain stuff like that. Uh, the more school you recognize, that won't mean nothing to somebody that don't know what service you educated. Certainly. Certainly. Yep. That, that needs to be us going on Sunday. That well, needs to be us. With our studio, you know, we got our studio. We brought our studio because it yeah. used to be upstairs. Now we brought it downstairs. And that was just something else. And I was like, look, we need to put the studio downstairs. We got brethren running up and down the steps. And they can't worship because they stuck up in some room. Let's bring the studio downstairs. So the elder did that. And we ran the projector from the well. When the congregation saw the projector, because we have two big screens, I think we got two that size, but they're stationary. They're not. They're not mechanical, and um, and, and they love it. So they saw it. It's like so. Now we've got some members that's coming. Say, hey, I would like to run a studio, but I don't know how. So now I'm going to teach a computer class at Avondale. I'm going to teach a computer class on some on Saturdays, so the older members can, so they don't feel so. Like just yeah. left behind, yeah. cause it can be it can it can be daunting. It can be daunting when you're like, I hate technology, and I just don't want anything to have to do with it. But it's here, and it's not going anywhere. And so to ease some of the reservations, we're gonna have a class and just teach them some simple things. You know, some apps, tablets. You know, the PC, websites, just simple things like that. And, and and I don't have any reservations about mixing congregations. Like I don't like a lot of people like, oh, we, the churches ought to be mixed. Well, I feel like church look like whatever community is serving. That's my thought. Now, if the community is mixed, the church should be mixed. If the community is eighty percent Hispanic, the church is going to be eighty percent Hispanic. I'm not going to drive from Avondale all the way to Hickson so we can get a white person to come to Avondale. Yeah, like I got folk that need the gospel right outside my door. So, that, you know, because if we don't hold that idea that church has got to be mixed, then please go to a congregation in Ghana and tell me what you see. And, and that is a good idea. That, that is a wonderful idea of bringing leadership together from various congregations and discussing the plights that, that are affecting each church. Actually, Apostle Pulpit, and many of you know, I will, I will actually be speaking at Apostle Pulpit this year. Um, I'll be doing an evangelism panel. 
and then I'll be teaching evangelism class this year at Posh and the Pulpit. But that's the way Posh and the Pulpit happened. It, um, it, it was just a couple preachers getting together having lunch and just talking about things that were going on at their congregation. They, they would also swap sermons. You know, those two preachers get together have lunch and they would swap sermons. So that's how Posh and the Pulpit came to be. And that is a good, that's a great idea. There's nothing against that. Get together, talk to each other, talk to different congregations about how can we reach our youth. People don't change overnight. And again, these are things you can't do at once. You know, you can't have one seminar one time and think that's going to be the cure-all. It's got to be a consistent effort across the board and over time. And um, and so you, you got to do that. Also, unfortunately, people are not truly converted. People are Sunday Christians. So when it comes to stuff like this that don't interest them, you know, they, they don't care. But if we can go ahead and reach our youth now, we can raise up. We can raise up Christians who appreciate God. And then when they get older like this, they'll be you. And they'll be sitting here and they'll have their kids. And because they remember, they were able to remember their creator in the days of their youth. Because when you get older and those evil days draw now, you just like, whatever. Questions or comments? I hope that these answers are, I, you know, I'm just praying that these answers are sufficient, you know, but they're on the spot, so I'm answering this stuff on the spot. Uh, I, I'm, whenever Brother Rap tells us we're done, we're done, but if you got any other questions, I'm just appreciate it, bro. Appreciate it. And thank y'all for having me again. It's, it's my pleasure. Again, I want y'all to think tomorrow morning, youth pew packing. I want you to get as many young folk here as you can. I got a good lesson for them. Good lesson for them. And y'all will see visual aids. I'll use some visual aids. Amen. Thank y'all for listening. Let's give Brother Eric and Sister Dale. We certainly, again, thank you guys. And you have you have done what we call you to do. Yeah. To encourage us. And I'm and I and I'm just like Brother Russell. I, I just wish that we would have had more. And and you know, it goes to say, uh, Last week, we, we had a Bible Bowl banquet. It was the end of our Bible Bowl season, and we had a house full of kids. And our encouragement was for them to bring the kids back this week. You know, we can go to the banquets where we're going to have food and, and have a good time, but then when it comes to learning, it seems like it becomes secondary. Uh, we even went so far as we sent letters out, uh, and, and I had Russell. Uh, I gave Russell a sheet with 20 preachers named just in the area. And I said, we're going to send letters, but Brother Russell, I want you to call each one of these preachers individually and invite them in their church. So you got to do what you can. And just pray that, and, and, and I've been around long enough to know when we have these workshops and seminars, you don't know what's going to happen. One day, Brother King will be a house fool, and one day it might just be you. You know, you, 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 it's hard to, it's hard to say who, uh, who's coming. So, you know, again, I, I'm like you, brother. You have to continue to keep going. You know, and I said to the elder earlier, I said, you know, is it, is it beneficial to do it? But then as soon as I said it, my mind went to, you got to. You, you got to continue, and hopefully it will at some point catch on and it will become important to parents. Uh, Cause kids can't drive themselves here, Amen. so it's got to be on the parents to find it important to get the kids here. Again, um, thank you, Eric. Uh, we're looking forward to tomorrow. Let's invite somebody if we can, uh, especially a young folk uh, uh, that we uh, that we might be able to have a blessed day on tomorrow. We got a few young men that have been acted in our service, and we, we we're looking at them. We're getting them, and I. Uh, you know, my passion uh, is to teach young men. Uh, I, 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 nothing, nothing serves me better than to see young men catch a hold to the word uh, and, and desire to, to be preachers. You know, and, uh, and the congregation know here, every time I see a young man, as soon as he start walking, I, I, I look at him, I say, boy, he's going to be a preacher. <laughs> I, it's just me, you know, any young man, I, I, I already claim him to be a preacher. Now, half of them ain't got preaching on their mind even when they get to that age. But uh, if they come by me, I'm going to claim him to be a preacher. And I, I, I just pray at some point, some of them will be.
know we're gonna get them all, but I ain't gonna I ain't gonna hold us out. I've, I've cut Eric down, so we uh, we again just 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 thank them. Uh, thank all of you for coming. You have made this a special day. Thank Brother Chris and his wife, Brother King, Brother Elam, the preachers, and Brother Scruggs and his lovely wife for being with. We got a young man that uh, just have moved in the area from Chattanooga, uh, going to be. He's working uh, with the Jackson Heights Church in Columbia as an intern minister. We want him to stand and, and just tell us who you are. Anytime you feel like you need to get in the full field, come talk to me. <laughs> we'll, we'll turn you loose. Won't we, bro, bro? Amen. We'll, 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 we'll turn you loose. That's our passion. We believe in training young men uh, that has a desire to, to be leaders and preachers in the church. All right. We've got a song. Our brother Story going to give us a verse of a song. And who's down for closing? And brother Ward, one of our elders, will give us our benediction. Brother Joe. Uh, you just pray for the food. I know you will. Let us stand, sing a verse for song, and then we'll be good. We'll turn to page 396. We'll, we'll sing the first and third stanza. Uh, before we sing, you know, I, I, I too am, am looking back, and, and I wish that, the, that we had standing room only. But what we can do, the pearls of knowledge that was, that was so, so gracefully given to us this morning, make sure you pass it on to somebody. You know, all the thoughts and the ideas that we got today, let them not lie dormant in your mind and your heart. You know, pass them on because they, they were given to all of us that are here this morning for a reason. 396. I will leave this land of bondage with its earthly treasure. I'll journey to a place where there love on every hand. I'll exchange a land of heartache for a land of pleasure. I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan. Everybody sing, every day I'm camping toward the land of Canaan. And with rapture I'll survey wondrous beauty. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Found the land of promise. I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan. Yes, I reached the land of promise with its scenes of glory. My journey ending in a place so lovely and so grand. I'll be led by Jesus to that blessed land of story. I'm camping, I'm camping. Towards Canaan, everybody sing, every day I'm camping, toward the land of Canaan, and with rapture I'll survey wondrous beauty, oh glory, glory. We thank Brother Garner and Sister Garner for Amen. being with us today. We thank you for the good lesson that you you taught us today to the parents. We can't do in and everything for our children. We have to be parents. We and, and they copying after us as we going out doing this and that and trying to tell them not to do it. They're going to do it when they get in school or out in the world. They're going to do it because you are not setting a good example, and we all can stand a change. And, and, and because God's word is is good to us, but we use it the way we want to please ourselves. So we as members here, we all need to make a change and do what God will have us to do. Thank you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for helping us to come out this morning to hear a portion of the Holy Divine Word. We ask you to bless the speakers this morning, Father. Bless them in every which way they stand in need of. Bless them. 
as they begin to have a newborn sometime in this year, Father, we ask you to just be with them and just crown their head with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Not only them, dear Lord, we ask you to bless each and every one that are here. And we thank you for your daughter's son who gave his life, that we all might have a right to trail life. We thank you for the weather. We thank you for our health and our strength. We pray for the sick and shut in, that you be with them and those in the nursing home. Bless them, dear Lord. And Father, we thank you for the food that been prepared for the nurse and our body. Bless those that prepared, dear Lord. This is my prayer in your sick name. Amen. 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 We are ready now, so if you want to come on in.